Hey, what is going on creative coders? This is the website for thisisdash.com. They have this really cool trailing grid effect. You know, the whole website is cool, but I just wanna look at how to do this in P5.js today. So we have an example over here. Of course, I just have a heading and we just have this kind of trailing squares following you. It's gonna be a lot of fun. We'll start with just getting a grid and a square on page to follow the mouse. And then we'll look at how to get these random neighbors that show up and then fade away. Uh, and then we'll just make sure that it works for resizing the screen and everything like that. So stick around and we'll hop right into the code. Hey there, Web Bay. All right, so we're gonna start by defining some constants that we're gonna use throughout our code just to make sure that we're using the same values all over the place. So we'll define a cell size of 40 pixels. We'll get the red, green, and blue values. I'm using exactly what they used on thisisdash.com, but you probably wanna use something different. And then starting alpha is 255. This is like the starting opacity. So this is just like fully, what is the word, opaque or not invisible at all. And we're gonna actually decrement that value each draw call to get that nice trailing effect. And we have a background color set to 31. That's gonna be almost black, but not quite because zero is all the way black and 255 is all the way white. And we have a probability of our neighbor. This is gonna come into play later, deciding if we're gonna display a neighbor or not. We have an amount of fade per frame. This You could adjust this, make this higher, and it'll fade away faster. And then our stroke weight, weight this is gonna determine the size of the border on the box that we're drawing on screen. All right, we also need some variables. We're gonna track the color with alpha, the num rows and num calls. And so that's gonna depend on the screen width, of course. We're gonna set our initial current row to negative one and the initial current column to negative one because we don't actually wanna have a current row or column when we start. And then we're gonna store all of our neighbors in an empty array. Of course, it's not gonna be empty when we're storing neighbors in there. And you can see over to the right, I just have a empty index.html. This is loading the P5.js script, but there's nothing there to show right now, so it's just blank. But let's go ahead and get that canvas set up in the setup function here. And so we'll call create canvas and we'll pass the window width and window height. I'm gonna just make this thing the full size of the viewport and I'll show you how to get it in Webflow so that it works with scroll. Uh, but I'm not gonna constrain it to any containers. I do have other tutorials on that if you wanna see. Anyways, so now let's actually define color with alpha. The reason I defined, I said let color with alpha out here and then actually define it inside setup is because we only have access to this color function within setup or within draw. We can't call it out here in the global namespace. All right, so we're gonna pass our RGB values and the starting alpha to that, nothing crazy. We'll set no fill so that we're not actually filling the square with any color. We'll set our stroke to be the color with alpha. So that's just this one that we defined up here. We'll set our stroke weight to be our constant stroke weight, which is one pixel. And we'll get the num rows and we're gonna take the ceiling of window height divided by cell size. So if we take our window height, obviously say it's something like 2000 pixels and our cell size is 40. If we have 2000 divided by 40, then we know we're gonna want 50 cells tall. And we need to do the same thing for the number of columns. So we're just using math.ceiling to make sure that we're not getting any decimals that's gonna round it up. And so we may overflow the page a little bit, but you could set overflow hidden or whatever on the wrapping container. All right, if I save and refresh, I get absolutely nothing on the page. So let's start working on our draw function. So with draw, the very first thing I'll do is to set the background color to our background color, the constant. And now if I save and refresh over here, you can see we get that nice black color that they're using on the thisisdash.com website. Okay, but let's make some more stuff happen. Uh, I'm going to calculate the row. Let's scroll down a little bit. Now I wanna calculate the row and column of the cell that the mouse is currently over. So let's start with just trying to get some grid and squares on the screen. And the way we can do that is we use this floor function, which there's a math.floor in JavaScript, but in P5, they give us access to floor just to make it easier. They they go through and look at like whether you're working in the global namespace and give you access to all these handy functions. Anyways, it can be a little bit confusing when you're starting, but just so you know, either one exists. And the main thing it does is it rounds down for you. So we take our mouse Y position and we divide it by the cell size, and that's gonna get the row that we're on very similar to what we did up here using our num rows. But back down here, we're getting our row and we're storing it in a variable called row. And we need to do the same thing with column. So we'll take the floor of the mouse X position. Again, that's given to us by P5 and we'll divide it by the cell size, which in this case is 40. Now, this isn't a necessary step, but something we could do is that we could make a nested for loop where we're looping through all of our rows here and then all of our columns. You know, we have column less than num calls. 
and we'll get the x and y coordinates and we'll just use p5 and draw a rectangle using the rect function. We're setting the x and y coordinates to these values that we calculated above and the cell size to our cell size, which I'm realizing is actually all capital. So let me copy this and we'll just drop that in here and I'm gonna hit control D to change them all at once. And now if I refresh, you can see that we have our grid here, but we don't wanna draw these all at once, right? So this is actually worthless code that we don't want. And let's go ahead and see what we do want. So we wanna check if the mouse has moved to a different cell. I'm gonna actually save and refresh over here just so that we're back on a blank page. And if yes, we'll get some random neighbors to display. And so we can just start coding this right now. If the row that we calculated above does not equal our current row, remember the very first value for this is negative one for both current row and current column, which as soon as we get our mouse on the page, this is going to be true then we want to set our current row to the row that we calculated here and we want to set the current column to that column value. Okay, now we've got our current row and our current column. Let's go ahead and just display this a square on screen. We can calculate an x and y value by taking our current row and current column and multiplying it by the cell size. Very kind of the opposite idea of what we're doing up here. And then we can draw a square using the rect function from p5. The first two parameters are the x and y value and the second are the cell size. Since it's a square, these are going to match. So I could save and refresh over here. And now we can see we have the square that's kind of uh, following our mouse, but you'll notice it's going away and that's because we're drawing the background every time, right? So don't worry, we'll get to fixing that. Um, it does actually fade away on the this is dash website, uh, but we'll, we'll kind of make our own way here. So let's get rid of all this. And we're back at our get random numbers to display. Now, what I wanna do is access this all neighbors array here. Now I'm going to call a function called get random neighbors here and pass it that row and column that our mouse is at. And we'll get back to this right now, but since we're calling it, we need to actually define this function. All right. So we'll define our function here, get random neighbors. It's going to take a row value and a column value. And what we want to spit out is basically an array of neighbors to display. We're going to treat this as kind of like a three by three grid, which has nine available cells for us to display. Of course, we're going to be displaying the middle one, but we'll use that probability constant that we defined earlier in our code to decide how many to actually display. So it's going to be different every time, but we kind of want something between maybe like two and seven. We don't really want to display all of them all the time. We don't want to display none. So we'll just let our probability value do that. And you could tweak it, you know, if you want to display less or you want to display more uh, just to do that. Anyways, let's go ahead and write this function. So we're gonna define that array and we're gonna set it empty. We'll just call it neighbors and we're gonna initialize it here. And now our job is to fill that with the, um, the grid cells that we wanna show. So let's go ahead and loop through the cells surrounding the given cell. And we can do that by using a for loop and we'll, de we'll declare this new variable called d row is negative one. And it's gonna go up to positive one. So we're using less than equals here. So essentially think of like zero, zero as the middle cell and then negative one is the row before it and positive one is the row after it. And I'm going left and right with my hands, but in the case of rows, negative one is gonna be the row above and positive one will be the row below. So we'll nest another loop and this is how we're gonna go through the columns. And this I can use my hands left and right to go from the negative one column to the one. Again, everything's relative to the middle, which we're treating as zero, zero here. So now we wanna calculate the neighboring cells row and column indices. And all we have to do to do this is add D row and D column to our row and column value. Since we already are passing those as parameters in the function, like this could be 38, you know, but now we're checking 37, 38, and 39, both for the row and the column. And then the next thing we wanna do is check if the current cell in the loop is the given cell, because if it is the given cell, we're just gonna display that no matter what, so we don't really care about it. So if D row equals zero and D call equals zero, uh, we're gonna do nothing, but we'll get to that in just a second. Now let's check if the neighboring cell is within the grid boundaries. That's another edge case that we wanna check. So we don't really care if the mouse pointer is left of zero or right of whatever the max is or above or below, whatever like that. So we just define this variable called is in bounds. And we're gonna check if our neighbor row is greater than zero and if the neighbor row is less than number rows, and we'll do the same for the column. So this is gonna be a Boolean value that returns true if our mouse is in bounds. And then if the cell is not the current cell, is within bounds and meets probability, then we'll add the neighboring cell to the neighbor's array. So this is where the logic of our get random neighbors function is truly happening. So we have a big if statement here. We're checking if it's not the current cell, if it is in, and it is in bounds, and 
are a math.random, which returns a value between 0 and 1, is less than the probability of neighbor, which in this case is 0 0.5, then we want to add this to the array. So we'll call neighbors.push, which is how we add an item to an array, and how we're going to track it is with a JavaScript object. So just open and close curly brackets here, and within that, we're going to define three properties. The properties are row, call, and opacity. And we're going to set the values to the neighbor row and neighbor call. Again, just the one that we're kind of looking at in this nested for loop. And the opacity is going to be our starting alpha value of 255. So it's going to start out super visible. And then over time, we're going to decrement that back up in our draw code. The last thing we need to do, of course, is to return this array called neighbors so that we can use it in our draw function above. We still haven't really actually changed anything on our canvas yet. If I save and refresh, you can see we're not even getting our square because I got rid of that rect function. So let's go ahead and start working on getting these random neighbors onto our screen. Okay, so we'll use the calculated row and column to determine the position of the cell. And this is exactly what we did above, but I am going to do it outside of this if statement now. So let x equal call times cell size and let y equal row times cell size and then we'll draw a highlighted rectangle over the cell under the mouse cursor. This is exactly what we did before. We're setting the stroke color and we're calling the rectangle function or rect in this case and setting it to X, Y and cell size. So if I save and refresh, you can see now we're getting this square that stays here. It doesn't fade away and just follows our mouse. So great, we're making good progress, but let's bring in those neighbors. So I'm gonna draw and update all the neighbors. Let's start by looping through all the neighbors. So we'll define a variable called neighbor and we'll use the of syntax here of all neighbors. This is just convenient way to loop over things in JavaScript. So we'll get the neighbor X and we'll store that in a variable. And we to get that, we take the column value of our neighbor. Remember we're passing a JavaScript object here with row, column and opacity values. So we're getting the column value up here and multiplying it by cell size, get neighbor Y, take the row value and multiply by cell size. That's exactly the same code as here, but for the neighbors in this case, not for the current cell. And then we're gonna decrease the opacity of the neighbor each frame. So we'll say neighbor.opacity equals max, and then max. this max function takes two parameters, either zero or neighbor.opacity minus amount of fade per frame. So it starts at 255, and this is set to five. So the first frame, it's gonna go down to 250, then down to 245, all the way down until it hits zero and then it's going to just be zero. Now let's define our stroke. So we need to update our stroke because we're changing this opacity here, right? We're defining that at this line above. So we got the red, green, and blue values. Those don't change, but we're gonna set a different opacity. And now we need to actually draw that neighbor on screen. So we'll call the rect function. We'll pass it neighbor X, neighbor Y for the position and cell size for the size. Now, if I save and come here and refresh, we can see I'm starting to get neighbors and trails and everything's starting to look really cool and really good. And let me slow it down if I go one. So that one had seven neighbor show. That one had six. This one had three. That one had two. That one had one. That one had three. That one had three. So our little random probability function is creating this really cool effect uh, as well as how we're decrementing the opacity on each frame. If a square has opacity zero, it doesn't make sense to keep that in our array. Over time, that array could get really big and just create a lot of performance problems with our code. So what I'll do is I'll filter all neighbors and filter takes a function and that function gets the neighbor that's within the array. And all I'm saying is that I want to filter the all neighbors array for any neighbor with opacity greater than zero. If it's less than or equal to zero, which it's probably never gonna be less than zero because of our max call up here, but if it is equal to zero, then we just wanna drop it and forget about it. So we're just filtering everything with opacity greater than zero and storing that, resetting our all neighbors array to that value. So this is great, it's performing well, everything looks good. The only thing really is that when we're resizing our canvas, it looks super ugly. So let's go ahead and add a window resize function. And I'm gonna do that all the way at the bottom here. P5JS gives us access to this window resized function and we're gonna call this resize canvas function. We'll pass in the new window width and window height. And then we also need to recalculate our num rows and num columns because we're changing our grid, right? So if I save that now and refresh, of course, our grid is looking good, but now it's looking good and we can go ahead and resize the page as much as we need to. Now, lastly, if you wanna use this in a real website, like I have here and I can scroll and it's still displaying, what we gotta do, I'm just gonna open up Webflow here and I dropped the code in on a page let me zoom in. 
down here in the before closing body tag, we have all the same code, but you'll notice in my setup function, I stored this create canvas. It returns uh, the canvas that was created and we'll store it in a variable called CNV, which stands for canvas, of course. Now, these three lines are the only thing I added for the Webflow project. I'm setting the style to fixed so that it stays fixed on top of the screen. And I'm setting the style inset to zero, which means it's gonna cover the whole, uh, I don't know, <laughs> it's gonna be like stretching up to the top, up to the sides, and then down to the bottom. And lastly, we'll set the Z index to negative one, so it sits beneath everything. Now, if you saw one of my previous videos where I was working with Z index and P5.js, you know it can make things a little bit funky. So the way I solved it in this one, I have my main container and then I have a static BG color. This is set to absolute uh, to cover everything and the Z index is negative two. So it's covering everything within the main container here. And then everything else is just gonna sit on top of that because the Z index is auto. And so this is negative two so we can see it, but then on the publish page we'll have the P5JS code at Z index negative one. So it'll be in front. I need to do it opposite on camera. And then all of our content will be spread in front of that. All right, that wraps up this video. If you like these complex animations on Canvas, be sure to check out the scaling circles animation that I made when I recreated Area 17's hero section for their 2022 year in review website. That uses Paper.js, which is a different library from P5, but had a lot of fun working with SVG and figuring out some cool tricks to get these really nice effects. Anyways, thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next one.